The first time I came was 1959. I had a two-year grant to come to Japan. First year I spent in language training. And then when language courses were over in May, I spent about a month traveling. So we took a train up from Tokyo, my wife and small kid, uh, who was uh, then two and a half, uh, and came to Sendai and spent a few days here. And I had some friends already at Tohoku University. So I spent some time uh, looking around there. But then, the, uh, in some ways, the most interesting thing I did was to spend three weeks looking at fishing villages in the Sendai area. And the guy who showed me around is the second sort of, uh, is now a retired professor at Tokyo University, and I will see him today. So a lot of the fishing villages that were wiped out in the tsunami, I was able to visit uh, when I was a young 29-year-old uh, when I first came to Sendai. Uh, I haven't followed all the changes in Sendai systematically, but in the 70s and 80s, uh, I had a feeling that Sendai was one of the hot places for growth, that it was quite economically a kind of a boom town and uh, was growing and a lot of new buildings came up and a lot of excitement. And the combination between the beautiful scenery around the edges uh, and Tokyo University as a first class uh, university and uh, the area around uh, Sendai City uh, made it a very attractive. Uh, mid-sized city uh, in Japan. So uh, I came only once since the earthquake hit, and uh, I didn't have a chance to look at Sendai carefully that time. I was in a group that traveled around some of the places that were hit by the earthquake. But the amazing thing to me in Sendai is how rapidly they reconstruct things. Uh, I remember the first trip my wife and I took after leaving the United States, we went through London and then through Europe and came to Japan. And in London, there was still a lot of rubble on the streets in 1958 uh, from World War II. When we got to Japan, there was no rubble. Uh, it had all been cleaned up. And uh, there were still a lot of empty places, but it had been cleaned up and the construction was already well along, much better than in England even though it was a defeated country and a terrible place. And I had the same feeling about Tohoku uh, and the uh, uh, earthquake and tsunami disaster, that you guys must have worked very hard and cleaned it up. Well, first of all, my practical advice would be do whatever you need to get a job. And uh, when I used to be in charge of these days in the studies program at Harvard, I would tell the students, you know, do what you have to do to get your thesis okay, uh, or BADs or whatever, and do whatever you have to do to satisfy, get a solid income, and then you can go on for there. Um, what I did when I was learning to give speeches in Japan, um, I, you know, I had a certain level of Japanese. I had a uh, Japanese teacher who was really terrific, and this was his idea. I would take a tape recorder, and now I'm sure you could use a little cell phone I had, you know, um, and I would talk for about two minutes in Japanese. And then we would replay it. And then he would stop me and say, you know, that's not very clear. And his idea was, try to be clear. Don't try to be clever. Don't use big words. Don't use fancy expressions. Just try to think of how the person listening can understand what you're saying. So that's really the important thing. So he would stop me after, you know, say a couple of sentences. He says, here, try this. And then he would give a sentence that was so much better than what I said, so much clearer, and often was very simple and straightforward. It was not fancy. So then, after we get through the two minutes, then I'd do it again. And uh, I would speak into the thing for two minutes. And uh, I would, you know, say something. And, you know, if I had patience and we had time, I might do it a third time. So we did that, you know, every time I met him once or twice a week for a few months. And that really helped me a lot because I think it gave me uh, kind of the confidence uh, that I could communicate and that people understood. And then, you know, I've got a lot of opportunities to do public speaking. So I, I always try very hard to, to look at the audience and think about what they know 
and try to think of ways that can communicate to them so they can understand and they can be very clear. And sometimes it's pronunciation, sometimes it's a way of phrasing an issue, of starting out with something so that they know where I'm coming from. And sometimes you just say a nice sentence, they don't have the context and it doesn't mean anything. So sometimes you have to sort of set the framework so that when you say a certain sentence, it's very clear and communicates. So that's my practical advice. That gets, and oh, the other thing is, get a teacher who's particular and strict in things like pronunciation. I think a lot of teachers in my day, you know, you say anything exactly, ah, oh, it's a day. And they would, you know, uh, we get a lot of bad habits. In fact, I had a lot of bad habits that I had to go back and get corrected and do over and over again, which is very painful. And I think uh, the other important advice I would have is get somebody who's strict and who, who is a stickler for pronunciation and has a sense of what people think and what they understand. Uh, and who's not going to let you, let you get away with stuff. No matter how famous you are, or you know how determined you are, and somebody can say, "Look, that's not the way to do it," and that, that, that kind of person is a great friend, and uh, you ought to be thankful to those people who are strict.